Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. This is episode 3, now in this little mini-series for the Fly-By-Wire A320 mod in Flight Simulator 2020. So in this video we're going to cover takeoff and climb phase as we take our airplane off from Dallas-Fort Worth here on runway 17 right on our way to Phoenix, Arizona. So before we get too far into the video, I want to go over a couple things that are very important. One of which is the flight control sensitivity settings that I use for my stick. Now, until the fly-by-wire mod A320 gets its flight characteristics tweaked a little bit, there are some limitations within the sim that we have to overcome by using some curvature on our hardware. I prefer the joystick Hotas Warthog as my primary flight control stick. This is what the stick looks like right here. I know it's designed for an A10. I also know that it's a right-handed stick, so it may be kind of weird uh, sitting in the left seat for some of you using the stick, but for me, the tactile feel of this joystick is the most realistic thing to the real aircraft that I have used on a desktop sim. Now I know there's the Thrustmaster TCA stick that's come out. I haven't expressed too much interest in that side stick just because I know it's it's plastic and I know the materials and, and kind of how the uh, sensitivity, or not the sensitivity, but how the tension is on that stick. Uh, very similar to the T1600, which I have used. But the Warthog has a very stiff feel to it. And it seems to me if I were to have a Warthog stick that was an Airbus stick here and I just put it on this base, it would be as close to the real thing as you could probably get at your home flight simulator. Unless, of course, you went and spent quite a bit of money on some of those very, very high end flight peripherals that you can get for an Airbus. So I do prefer the Airbus Warthog. But you do need to check with your sensitivity settings here. So these are the sensitivity settings that I use in both pitch and roll. Now it may seem a little extreme, 33% here. This should actually be 33. Let's see, I couldn't get it quite to 33. It kept jumping on me. There we go. So 33% on this axis here, on the uh, lateral axis, left and right. And then on my pitch axis, I also have about a 31% curvature on my side stick. Now, in the real airplane, you are very rarely, if ever, going to use full scale deflection of the side stick. Unless you're responding to an RA or a jip whiz, you're probably never going to move the stick more than about 50% in a normal flight. So, having a little bit steeper curve towards the end of the range there, to me, is no big deal at all in a flight sim because. I'm really going to be just operating right here in this range about that 50% mark at maximum. So having these curves really dampen the effect and the jitteriness of some of the flight characteristics that we see in Flight Simulator 2020. So if you have a flight stick, even if it's different than what I'm using here, the Warthog, maybe you want to just at least give these settings a try and then tweak from there to help kind of smooth out your sensitivity. Now as far as my rudders go, I have a very, a very um, significant uh, curvature as well on my rudders so you can see here look at my rudder axis my rudders are very um, let's just say they're on their last leg I mean I've got one pedal that doesn't even really work and the spring in one side is broken so I have and you could just see the noise there of it jittering back and forth so my my rudders you may want to adjust these accordingly if you have a high quality rudder pedal then you don't need to worry about this mine have been through a beating over the years and multiple moves and all that so that is why I have such a high uh, such a high sensitivity curve there for my rudders but those are my settings that I use that I feel help dampen the twitchiness that we see in some of the characteristics here in Flight Simulator 2020. So I'm just going to go ahead and apply and save there because I fixed that one. So, all right, that gets us back in there. It looks like an airplane just went over our heads. I probably shouldn't be paused here on the runway. But right now we are lined up on the runway and we are ready for departure. Our flaps are out. Our, our takeoff config has been completed. Everything is done. We are ready to go. So what we're going to do here on departure, we're going to spool up the thrust levers to 50% here. So with our N1, we want to put this little... Uh, blue do donut, if you will, right at that 50% mark, wait for both engines to stabilize, and then we're going to go straight into either our flex detent, if we are doing a flex takeoff, or we're going to go all the way to toga. Now, let's quickly talk about the difference between flex and toga. 
All right, so let's talk about flex takeoffs and toga takeoffs. First and foremost, what is a toga takeoff? A toga takeoff is a maximum thrust takeoff. Whatever the outside air temperature is, the ambient pressure, all the information that you put in the MCDU, that is all computed and the engines are going to give you all the power that they have at that given day for that takeoff. You're going to have reduced takeoff roll, increased climb rates, increased uh, speed acceleration, but you're also going to have increased asymmetric thrust should you lose an engine during a toga takeoff, but it is the maximum performance takeoff available for the airplane. Now, let's flip that coin. What is a flex takeoff? A flex takeoff, very simply put, is a reduced thrust takeoff. Some of you Boeing guys may refer to it as a derated takeoff or a derated thrust takeoff, but essentially all that we're doing with a flex takeoff is using less than maximum thrust for that takeoff roll. Now, why would you want to use a less than maximum takeoff thrust? The number one reason is engine life. It preserves the engines. The more you use toga, the more wear and tear that's going to be accelerated on that engine because it is operating at maximum power every single time you take off. Now, especially pre-COVID, these airplanes are flying all the time. They don't get a lot of brakes. They're constantly going through takeoff and landing cycles. So do using a reduced thrust takeoff, number one, saves on engine life. It also helps with the fuel consumption. You burn a little bit less fuel. It also helps with asymmetric thrust should you, lose, should you lose an engine. Now, that can be debatable because if you lose an engine, you may go into toga on the operating engine, but that's for another discussion later. So basically, what you need to understand for simulator purposes is that a flex takeoff is one that's going to give you less than maximum thrust, and it's basically to save the engine. Me personally, when I fly flight sim, if you watch any of my streams, there's no reason to save maintenance on the engine here in flight sim, so I just go full toga all the time. I think it sounds cool. It's pretty sweet to do a toga takeoff. Now, there are some instances in where you would not want to flex, even in the sim world, if you're trying to emulate a real life flight. So there's a couple things that I'll give you that you shouldn't flex on. If there's wind shear active at your airport, maybe there's some really convective activity going on, or there's a lot of convective activity around the airport and there's wind shear being reported, you probably don't want to use a flex takeoff. If you're taking off in a, on a contaminated runway, such as snow or standing water and slush, that would be an instance where you do not want to use a reduced thrust takeoff. Now the last reason that it would give you is if your flex number was within 10 degrees of the outside air temperature. So let's say you're taking off somewhere hot and it's 35 degrees Celsius and you get a flex number of 40 degrees. Now if you use a flex calculator or whatnot, there's a bunch of videos on YouTube. I'm not going to get into that. But let's say you have a flex number of 40 degrees but it's 35C outside, you are not supposed to flex. You're supposed to use a toga thrust. So if that temperature is within 10 degrees of your flex number, just go full toga. And of course, if performance permits, if you need to toga thrust at any time, maybe you messed up and you're taking off the wrong runway or whatever it is in the sim world that you've encountered and you don't think you have enough power to get off the runway, just bump those thrust levers into the toga detent and get maximum thrust available. All right, so in Flight Simulator, there's really no need to save the engine life. I like to go man toga, so we're gonna go full toga takeoff on this departure. So make sure your top altitude is set, and here we go. I'll set the camera. Let's go ahead and release the parking brake. Now, unless you need to do a static thrust takeoff, you can go ahead and just spool up those thrust levers as you start rolling down. A Little bit of forward pressure on the stick there. Wanna keep that side stick in the forward position. Engines are stable take them all the way to toga. All right, so why would I put forward pressure on the stick? Very simply put, at low speeds, the rudder on the tail is not very effective until we have enough airflow going around it. So it is recommended by Airbus that you push forward on the stick, about two thirds deflection, keep a little extra pressure on that nose wheel. So should you need to correct for center line or lateral control, up until 100 knots, you have nice firm pressure on that nose wheel and you can really keep the airplane on the center line. As you get to 100 knots, you're going to reduce that to zero and the rudder will become fully effective. Now we announce the FMA. We have man toga, SRS runway, auto thrust is blue. Approaching 80 knots, verify the thrust is set. Our end ones are looking where they're supposed to be. Bring that stick to neutral pressure there by about 100 knots. V1, rotate, nice and easy on the stick, positive rate, gear up.
Now our command bars want us to go a little bit to the right here, so we're gonna go ahead and just follow the command bars. All right, so one thing I left out here was I left the ground spoilers armed. Make sure you disarm your ground spoilers upon gear retraction, and then you arm them when you extend the gear. Kind of think of them as tied together. So gear down, arm, gear up, disarm the ground spoilers. I got a little carried away here making this video, and I forgot to do that. All right, we're going to keep about 18 degrees nose up until we reach our acceleration altitude. There's our acceleration altitude, so we're going to go ahead and lower the nose first. As we lower the nose, we're going to see a positive trend in airspeed. Only until we, only when we see that positive trend in airspeed are we going to want to start reducing our thrust levers back to the climb D10. All right, so I wanted to pause the frame here and talk about something that's going to happen here at a pretty rapid pace. Now, this happens a little bit faster in the sim than it does in real life. With the current version of the fly-by-wire mod and the FS2020 A320, until the flight characteristics get tweaked a little bit, this is one thing that we really need to pay attention to here in the climb-out phase. So upon reaching your thrust acceleration slash reduction altitude, the airplane in FS2020 likes to reduce to a near flat pitch or wings level attitude here and accelerate. This acceleration happens at a very rapid rate and if you're not paying attention you may inadvertently overspeed your flaps so you have a little s speed here on your speed scale on the pfd this is indicative of these uh, flap slap retraction safe speed for the a320 so once you reach that speed you can go ahead and retract the flaps to zero from the takeoff configuration now it is important to note here that the airplane flight director command bars will command an almost a zero VSI to accelerate. So what I like to do here in the sim, just a little simism, is I tend to keep the aircraft pitch a little bit above what the flight directors are commanding me to do, just because if I go to wings level, the airplane will accelerate so fast that it's uh, very abrupt and unrealistic. So by keeping that pitch up just a little bit there, 8 degrees, 10 degrees even, you will accelerate nice and smooth through your airspeed and you'll be able to get the flaps up on time and not have to worry about overspeeding any part of the aircraft. Now, the fly-by-wire mod, as it is now, it likes to accelerate at almost a wings level pitch, so you really got to be careful. There's our S-speed. Disarm the spoilers there. And now we can go ahead and pitch right back up into the command bars. Now at this point, if you want, you can go ahead and engage autopilot one. All right, so at this time, as you're climbing out, just want to monitor the aircraft to make sure it is meeting its VNAV constraints. If it is not on any VNAV departure, you can change the climb mode if you so wish to either vertical speed or open climb. All right, so the airplane is climbing away. We are looking good here. Our restriction at Marn is at or above 5,000. We're well above that. We can go ahead and set our altitude, whatever ATC gives us, or in this case, we'll just go ahead and bring it all the way up to our cruise altitude down. We'll go ahead and set 340 in the box. All right, 9.8, upon reaching 10,000 feet, we're gonna go ahead and do a couple things. So we'll go ahead and turn off our landing lights, turn off our taxi light, and we'll go ahead and turn off our wing light. We're just gonna leave our strobes on, our beacon, and our nav. What we do here at Common Procedures, we also go ahead and ding the flight attendants, giving them the forward call. That lets them know that we're above 10,000 feet and they can go ahead and begin doing their in-flight duties. A couple other things that we do out of 10,000 feet, we'll come into our RadNav page. We'll make sure that we've cleared out anything that we've hard-tuned. So if you had Maverick hard-tuned in there for your VOR, you just go ahead and come here and hit clear. Go ahead and clear that out. That way the aircraft can auto-tune its VORs throughout the flight. Now you can see that here when I switch over to VOR mode on both of the uh, indicators there. Now we'll just go ahead and let the aircraft do its auto-tuning procedures. Once we've clear, cleared our RadNav page, what I also like to do is come to the secondary. If it was, if it was modeled, we'd go ahead and we'd copy our active flight plan. That way, if we make any changes or something gets messed up in our primary, we just have that backup in there as well. So we would copy our secondary, clear our RadNav, and then what you can do too here is when this eventually gets modeled, you would go ahead and put in your d destination airport here and you'd get a, a GPS readout. But until that gets modeled, we'll just go ahead and leave that page blank. We'll go ahead and sit back and enjoy the climb out.
All right, so that's going to wrap up our climb out video. Once you reach your transition altitude, whether it's 18,000 feet like it is here in the United States, or maybe it's much lower over there in Europe, uh, you would set standard on your air altimeters. But other than that, you are pretty much in the climb cruise phase of your flight now. So I will catch back up with you guys here in the next video. We'll talk a little bit about descents, methods of descent, and then, of course, the landing video will be following that one. So I hope you guys are enjoying these videos. Until next time, I'm V1. See ya!